This video is supported by Brilliant.org. The reality we experience as humans here on planet Earth is a web of lies. LIES! We've lived here on this globe for hundreds of thousands of years, evolved into being over a billion year process, shaped by the forces and conditions that are specific to this planet. We are the product of the conditions of this planet. So naturally, we look around at our environment and we think this is natural, this is normal. But time and again, we've been proven wrong on that. We looked out into the horizon and we saw a flat world and just assumed that the Earth was flat, logically. Until Eratosthenes proved that it was round in 100 BC. We saw the sun and the moon and the stars rotating above us and came to the logical conclusion that they circled around us. Until 1543, when Copernicus committed heresy! When we look up into the sky, we see this blanket of blue that seems to just extend forever, but the thickness of our atmosphere is incredibly thin. It's about the thickness of the paint on the top of a globe, proportionally. And of that, we can only survive in the lowest 10%. The air pressure on this Earth is very specific, and it alters everything. Which brings me to inertia. Our current understanding of inertia began with Sir Isaac Newton with his first law of motion in which he stated, an object at rest stays at rest and an object in motion stays in motion with the same speed and direction unless acted on by an outside force. And the problem with observing inertia here on Earth is that it's constantly being bombarded by some kind of outside force. Gravity, friction, air pressure, all of these things, they completely alter the true nature of inertia. Like imagine tossing a baseball up in the air and it just keeps going up and up, and up, forever. That would be crazy. But if you were in space, outside the gravity well of a star or a planet, that's exactly what would happen. That is the true nature of inertia throughout the vast majority of the universe. So today we're going to take a look at inertia and a controversial theory that might completely alter our entire understanding of the universe. Now before we jump into the craziness that is quantized inertia, I've got to give the standard disclaimer here. I am not an expert on this subject, I just find it interesting, and I'm going to explain it to the best of my understanding, which is shallow at best. Not that that's ever stopped me before, I've done lots of videos on, on these kinds of topics, but uh, as my channel's gotten bigger, I've felt a lot more of a responsibility to make sure I get the facts right, uh, so that's kind of why I haven't gone down this road that much lately. So in an effort to be more accurate in this video, I have secured the help of a fact checker. He's sitting right over there, and I'm going to be running some of this stuff by him. He's going to be keeping me honest throughout this video. So uh, you ready for this? You feeling good? You got, got the Google up on your phone? Your thumbs all, all loosey-goosey? I'm ready. Let's do this. All right. Cool. By the way, has anybody ever told you you look exactly like a really handsome man? Oh <laughs> yeah. All the time. I know. Me too. <laughs> me too. So as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, our understanding of inertia was first illustrated by Newton and his first law of motion. But like a lot of Newton's theories, he had a firm grasp on how it worked, but not quite why it worked. In the case of inertia, he came up with a thought experiment where you take a bucket of water and you suspend it by a rope. Of course, just hanging there still, the water would be flat across the top of the bucket. But if you twisted up the rope and let it go, causing the bucket to spin, the water would pool up on the sides of the bucket, causing a concave surface to the top of the water. Now we all understand this in practice, but why does this happen? Why doesn't the water just spin right along with the bucket? Why is this inertial force working against the water that's keeping it from spinning? Or take this video for example. Guy sitting in a spinning chair holding a spinning bicycle wheel. When he turns the wheel to the side, he spins counterclockwise. Turns it upside down, he spins the other direction. This is an example of the conservation of angular momentum. So Newton sees this phenomenon and he asks, but what is this momentum pushing against that's causing it to spin in that way? After all, an object that's at rest will stay at rest unless it's acted on by an outside force. Newton suggested it was something that he called absolute space, which is sort of an intrinsic quality woven into the fabric of the universe that objects move re in relation to. This is what causes that inertial force. Now this remained pretty much the accepted theory of inertia for hundreds of years until it was challenged in 1883 by Austrian physicist Ernst Mach in his book The Science of Mechanics. He was specifically trying to explain why a gyroscope remains pointed in a fixed direction while it's spinning. And what he theorized was that inertia relied on other bodies because all motion was measured as relative to other bodies. In other words, in a universe without any mass, inertia wouldn't exist. He argued that it was the mass of the universe, the mass of distant stars that created the inertial frame that we measure inertia against. 
Now this became known as Mach's principle, and while it's not all that accepted in science today, it was an early influence for Einstein's general theory of relativity. So far so good? Yeah, except it's pronounced Mac. Mac? Yeah, like Mac's principle. Oh, oh well, there you go. See, this is working, awesome. So through Einstein's theories of relativity and other refining of the ideas, inertia became fairly intrinsically related to uh, gravity. In the same way that any object with mass has gravity, it also has what's called inertial mass. Meaning the larger the object, the larger the inertial mass, and the more force it takes to move it from a resting position or to get it to change its speed or direction. There's all kinds of fancy formulas that have nailed all this down. But also just like gravity, on a fundamental level, we still don't quite understand the mechanics of exactly how inertia works. So inertia kind of tends to find its way into all of the efforts to combine quantum and relativistic physics, you know, the, the theory of everything, the way to kind of explain gravity on a quantum level. Which brings me to quantized inertia. Quantized inertia, also known as a modified inertia from a Hubble scale Casimir effect, was proposed in 2007 by physicist Mike McCullough from Plymouth University. QI, which is much easier to say, is sort of a modified theory of relativity that uses quantum vacuum fluctuations to explain inertia. Now we've talked about the quantum vacuum before and the way that empty space is not really empty, it's actually filled with quantum fields that correspond to the different particles in the standard model. And in these fields is a constant frothing up of virtual particles. Virtual particles are antiparticle particle pairs that pop up out of nowhere and then recombine to continue with the equilibrium of the quantum vacuum. So a vacuum in this sense is not like it's devoid of air. It means that uh, the quantum fields are at their lowest possible energy state. But even in this lowest energy state, you still have this frothing up of virtual particles all the time. And this weird little quirk of space-time forms the basis of a lot of what we're going to be talking about here. Now, the late great Stephen Hawking proposed a type of radiation that can come out of this quantum vacuum. This became known as Hawking radiation. So the event horizon of a black hole, as we all know, is a point in space beyond which no energy or matter can escape. It's a bad place to be. So what Hawking theorized was that right there at the edge of the event horizon, these virtual particles, antiparticle particle pairs are popping up and recombining just like everywhere else in the universe. But because of that horizon line and the black hole's voracious appetite, invariably one of these particle pairs or one part of the particle pair gets sucked into the black hole and the other one flies away. Now in normal conditions, this flyaway particle would just recombine with its corresponding antiparticle and return to equilibrium. But since the corresponding particle got devoured by the black hole, this now flies away as electromagnetic radiation, and that's Hawking radiation. And this is not theoretical. They've observed this, right? Uh, yeah, they observed it in uh, 2010. Cool, so taking this idea of Hawking radiation, there is another type of radiation created by a different kind of horizon that's been proposed. This is called UNRWA radiation. All right, so this starts to get a little bit more theoretical, but the idea is that any object that's accelerating through space-time creates a horizon. I need to explain what a horizon is. A horizon is a point in space beyond which information can't travel. An event horizon of a black hole is the ultimate example of this, but on the quantum level, any object accelerating through space-time can create a similar horizon. This is called a Rindler horizon. By the way, the Rindler horizon gets super complicated. I'm not going to touch it with a 10-foot pole here, but I'll put links that get more into the weeds on it down in the description below. But for our purposes right now, just know that this is a real thing. This is not theoretical. Okay, so back to UNRWA radiation. In the mid-70s, a team of physicists, including Stephen Fulling, Paul Davies, and Bill Unruh, theorized that this Rindler horizon could create a type of radiation that became known as Fulling-Davies Unruh radiation. Eventually, that just got shortened to Unruh radiation. Bill got lucky with that one. So just like the event horizon of a black hole can split up virtual particle pairs and create Hawking radiation, a Rindler horizon caused by an object accelerating through space-time can do the same thing and produce Unruh radiation. I think I got that right. Did I get that right? Huh? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Well, anyway, uh, UNRWA radiation is still a little bit theoretical. It's never really been observed, but it does provide the basis for uh, QI. Okay, so we've got an accelerating object creating a horizon and throwing off UNRWA radiation. The way we turn this into inertia is with the Casimir effect. 
The Casimir effect was first proposed back in the 1940s by Dutch physicist Hendrik Casimir, and it was actually observed for the first time in 1996. So this is for real. The idea is pretty simple, really. You take two plates, two very clean, flat plates, and you put them very, very close to each other, like microns apart. And what happens is it creates an attractive force that pulls the two plates together. Because the space between those plates doesn't give enough room for those virtual particles we were just talking about to pop up and appear. So there's more dense virtual particles on the outside than on the inside. This creates a force that pushes those two plates together. And the Casimir effect is also explained through wavelengths. Because these virtual particles appear in all kinds of different wavelengths, the longer wavelengths get disallowed in that tiny little space. And these interrupted wavelengths serve as an attractive force that pulls the two plates together. Am I right about that? Uh, yeah. So, uh, let's put all this together and see how this creates quantized inertia. An accelerating object creates this Rindler horizon, which throws off UNRWA radiation. Now, the space between the accelerating object and the horizon is very small. And in that space, the Casimir effect takes over, meaning the radiation in front of the object gets disallowed and the radiation behind the object is more dense than the radiation in front of it. This pulls the object toward the horizon in front of it, providing the force that we experience as inertia. Now, to be clear, quantized inertia is considered a fringe theory throughout most of the physics community. So while Mike McCullough does have plenty of books and articles and papers and videos on the subject, and they get really detailed, he's got equations to back all this up, and I'll put as much of that down in the description as I can, uh, this is still based off of theoretical stuff like UNRWA radiation, so skeptical minds should prevail here. Now, what it does have going for it is it removes the necessity for dark matter and dark energy. McCullough argues that while this works in tandem with uh, relativistic physics, it also explains a lot of things that relativistic physics can't explain, things like the rotation of galaxies. And this is where the idea of dark matter first took shape, is when they noticed that the rotation of galaxies didn't match the amount of mass that's actually in the galaxy. It actually required a lot more mass than we were actually observing. And this was also true for galaxy clusters and superclusters, so it was surmised that there must be some uh, matter out there that doesn't interact with light and doesn't interact with other matter in the way that we normally associate, and this became known as dark matter. Now McCullough claims when you plug QI equations into these same situations, the motions of the galaxies and the galaxy clusters make perfect sense without the need for some kind of exotic matter that we've never been able to find. In fact, there are some observed phenomena in globular clusters and uh, binary star systems called wide binaries that seem to not work with dark matter theory, but do work with QI. And he also believes that QI explains the accelerated expansion of the universe without using dark energy. How am I doing so far? Yeah. Now proponents also say that QI explains other phenomena that we've seen, including the Pioneer and flyby anomalies. The Pioneer anomaly refers to the Pioneer 10 and 11 missions, which did sort of a tour through the solar system before the Voyager missions a few years later. Uh, but what happened was when it flew by some of the planets, it actually accelerated a lot faster than the scientists were expecting. Now these have been explained as the venting of thermal radiation from the radioisotope thermoelectric generator, but QI proponents say that this explains that as well. But most controversially, QI is often used to explain the phenomena that we've seen in resonant cavity thrusters like the M-Drive. Now McCullough has often stated that if we understand the true nature of inertia, we should be able to manipulate it. This is analogous to saying that we can manipulate gravity or mass itself. Such an ability would give us propellantless drives that would allow us to fly through the universe at incredible speeds. All kinds of sci-fi stuff comes from this, like anti-gravity drives. In fact, DARPA thought it was so worth studying that they put $1.3 million to fund a four-year study into QI and horizon drives. So with any luck, QI could go from the realm of pseudoscience into the world of legitimate science. So we'll see. How'd I do? Dude. Dude. Are you playing a game? No. You're playing bricks and balls, aren't you? Dude, this level sucks. Did you hear anything I said? Uh, I think you lost me at Stephen Hawking. Awesome. Well, it looks like you guys, once again, are going to have to be my fact checker. So if there's anything that I got wrong, if you understand this stuff better than I do, let me know down in the comments below. And let me know what you think. Is this just a bunch of pseudoscience gobbledygook, or could this be the beginning of us having a whole new understanding of the universe? It's only one of those two things, people. Let me know what you think in the comments. 
So once again, this is a very high level overview of this topic. If you wanna get more into the weeds and, and the technical stuff, I'll put some links down in the description below. And if you are at my level, or maybe I lost you along the way, one way that you could maybe get caught up and understand this a little bit better is to go to brilliant.org. Brilliant is a learning platform that teaches you how to think like a scientist. Instead of just asking you to wrote, memorize a whole bunch of stuff from a fire hose of information, they teach you how to figure this stuff out on your own so it makes the most sense to you and you can apply it to other things too. If the topics in this video piqued your interest, you might want to start with the astronomy course. From there, you can move on to the gravitational physics course. And from there, maybe the special relativity course. And from there, you could rule the universe. You can sign up for an account at brilliant.org slash answers with Joe and get free access to their weekly puzzles and brain teasers and stuff like that. And if you want to take things a bit further and sign up for the premium subscription that gives you access to all their courses, the first 200 people that sign up from this video will get 20% off your subscription for life. It's called Brilliant for a reason, so go see for yourself. Brilliant.org slash answers with Joe. Links down in the description. Big thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video and a huge thank you to the Answer Files on Patreon that are supporting this channel, creating a great community, and keeping me honest. They're a lot better than my fact checker. Here are some of the new people that have joined. I want to murder their names real quick. We got Matthew Jackson, Daniel Llewellyn, uh, Michael Hardy, Claudie Pinky, William Stout, Joseph Fraser, Dana Rose, Brian Jensen, Brandon Kerr, Jan Johansson, Joe Jacobson, <laughs> Russ Henderson, Shane Miller, Pat Grat, George Koshi, uh, Jeffrey McCurdy, Jake Dengate, Ingeran Samaradinen, uh, Colm Berger, Ken, Eric Evans, Lars Wanscher, uh, Gail Hildebrandt, Will, and Billy Pope. Thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them and get early access to videos and access to me and to our Discord channel where we're doing all kinds of cool stuff, you can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. I'd also like to thank my fact checker over here for being totally useless. You're fired, by the way. Yes! Oh, sorry. I just beat the level. What'd you say? T-shirts available at the store at answerswithjoe.com slash shirts. Thanks again for watching. You guys go out now, have an eye-opening rest of the week. And I'll see you on Monday. Love you guys. Take care. Bye. Shut up.